Okay, so um, just uh, just a reminder, uh, uh, we had the kind of introduction to the to the stability and testability, and we will now see the connection with property P. I just want to say that this uh, connection will give mainly negative results. In a way, positive results are more interesting, but as you will see, it's just a notion of flexible stability, which will come up in the, in, in the next weeks, which really, um, uh, and then we'll see also some positive results and later on we'll see many more positive results. But uh, sorry for being negative and starting with the negative side. Okay, Owen. The, the, the stage is yours, so this is Oren Becker from uh, Cambridge. Yes, thank you, Alex, and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I'll start with uh, telling you what I'm going to tell you. Um, well, first, um, a bit of notation. Um, I'm taking uh, S to be some finite alphabet, and um, so just a finite set, and E, a system of equations over this alphabet, and then I'm taking a group gamma, uh, which is just uh, the group uh, with re the presentation generated by this formal set S subject to some relations E. Um, and uh, I'll be assuming that this group gamma is an infinite group that has property T. Yeah, uh, the, the notions will be recalled. And just for this first slide, let's also assume that this group gamma is residually finite, although we will be able to, to assume less. Then gamma is not stable in the sense of the previous two talks. Um, it's not even testable in the, in the sense of uh, Moshayov's talk from last week. Um, I, I will recall both the notions of stability, testability, even property T. Um, these are negative results, and they will give rise, as Alex just said, to uh, a weaker notion of stability that we call flexible stability, and then I, I will discuss it and uh, mention some results and, and open problems. Uh, but I'll begin with uh, reminders because I don't want to assume that you remember everything from the last two talks. Okay, so first, um, I, I'm, I'm writing DH, um, did you see my cursor? Yeah, you do, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm writing DH um, for the normalized Hamming metric or on the symmetric group, which just means that if I have uh, sigma and tau permutations uh, on the set one to n, then the distance between them just counts the number of entries where they differ and divides by k. So if they agree everywhere, if they are the same permutations, the distance is zero. If they agree nowhere, the distance is one, and otherwise it's somewhere in the middle. Another piece of notation is um, the metric on tuples. So I'm just extending this notion of the normalized Hamming metric. If I have a tuple sigma bar composed of D permutations in sim K and tau bar composed of D permutations in sim K, then the distance between the tuples is just a notation for the sum of the distances between sigma one and tau one, sigma two and tau two, and so on. Just D distances. Now I will remind you one of several definitions of a stable group that was given uh, in Alex's first talk. Um, an asymptotic homomorphism is actually a sequence of functions, not homomorphisms, from the group gamma to symmetric groups that get larger and larger. So it's a sequence of function. Such a sequence of function is called an asymptotic homomorphism if for every pair of elements, the distance between Fn of the product and Fn of gamma one times Fn of gamma two if, if Fn was a homomorphism, this would, the distance would be just zero. To call it an asymptotic homomorphism, I just ask this distance to approach zero when I go along the sequence, and this is for each pair separately. So it's, it's a pointwise thing. 
and asymptotic homomorphism is perfect, right? So I'm taking Fn and asymptotic homomorphism, like in, the, in this definition, and I say that it's perfect if there is a sequence of true homomorphisms, Hn from gamma to the same symmetric group gamma uh, sim Kn, yeah, so these HNs are homomorphism, actual homomorphisms, and for every group element, the distance between Fn of gamma and Hn of gamma, when I fix gamma and go along the sequence, goes to zero. So a perfect asymptotic homomorphism is one which is essentially equivalent to a sequence of actual group homomorphisms. And we say that the group is stable if all the asymptotic homomorphisms of the groups are in fact perfect. So this is one of the definitions that Alex gave. Uh, we, we, we might have, we, we will have another definition that I recall. Owen? Yes. Uh, is, there a, 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 is there any use of other convergence, like not pointwise convergence? of the stability, the, so, of the no, no, asymptotic no, no, homomorphism? No, not in this talk, uh, but the, there are results of, uh, I, I think Alex mentioned it in the first talk very briefly. There, there is a theorem of Kashdan about a minimal group and the theorem of Gowers um, and Khatami. They are talking uh, about uniform convergence here and uniform convergence here, for example. And I also have a result of this kind with, uh, with Michael Chapman. So certainly if you take it uniformly for all gamma one, gamma two, it, it is also studied, but, but not, not today. But the, the perfect doesn't give you a uniform, if you have perfect, doesn't it automatically give you some kind of a uniform uh, on, the, on the upper one, on the asymptotic one? Well, it, it gives you it gives you at least uniform for each for uniform on every for every n. Like you have you have uniform you have uniform uh, on the group and then you have uniform on the sequence of groups, right? Because yeah. you, you have you have a convergence. I'm trying to understand what you say. I mean, sim n is a finite group, so uniformity here is not very meaningful, if I understand what you're saying. No, never mind. In, in any case, in any case, this is the definition now. Point was here and point was here. If we if we understand each other, then maybe we yeah, yeah, never mind. Let's each other later. Okay. Um, and now, so, so, so this was stability for groups. Now I want to define stability for a system of equations. Um, so let S uh, again be a finite alphabet. Now I'm just calling the elements of S, S1 up to SD. And let E be a finite set of, of words over the set S and the inverses of the letters. So these are just elements of the you can think about them as elements of the free group over S. We have the space of solutions for E. This is the space of all tuples, D tuples uh, of permutations, D because I have the D letters, such that this sum is zero. I, I'll elaborate, but this sum is a sum of non-negative things, so it just means that all of the, those terms are zero. And what are these terms? This is just taking the word WI and substituting sigma bar to it. So what's written here actually is that WI sigma bar is equal to the identity for each of these words. So a solution is just a substitution of permutations into the letters such that all of these relations are satisfied. For example, if E is just the, word, the commutator word, so sol E n is, uh, is the set of commuting pairs of permutations. And I say that this system of equations 
So now I'm writing W is equal to one for W in E. So this is a system of formal equations that each of these Ws is equal to one. I say that it is stable. If whenever this sum that's written here, maybe it's not zero, but when it's very, very small, it means for, for, for a certain tuple sigma bar, it means that sigma bar is close to some solution. So I'm writing it like this. For every n and tuple, the distance between sigma bar and the space of solutions is at most some function of this measure of how much it solves the equations. Um, where this function, of course, I, I ask it to, to go to zero when, when this argument is very close to zero. And it's important that this function is this, uh, that I can use the same function for all n, no matter how large the permutations are. So if the, permut if the permutations almost satisfy, uh, if, if every tuple of permutations that almost satisfy the, the, the equations is actually close to a true solution, then I say that the system is stable. So th this is again something that appeared uh, in the last talks. And the basic observation about these things is that a system of equations is stable if and only if, when I take these systems and create a group for, from it uh, by means of a presentation, then the group is stable in the sense of asymptotic homomorphisms. So this, these are actually equivalent and, and, and this is the reason to study both of them together. Okay. The, is anyone saying anything? Maybe uh, maybe it's a good opportunity if you go back to the previous uh, slide just to mention a, a kind of remark. There is some uh, a kind of a philosophical remark. Uh, this this uh, slide basically is like a Galba theory. You have something you, you want to study about equation. You associate with the equation a group. And now, just like in Galba theory, the system is, is the, the polynomial is solvable if and only if the group is solvable. Here, the system is stable if and only if the, the group is stable. The difference is that in Galba theory, once you say this statement, you solve the problem because to decide whether a group is solvable is, is, is a difficult uh, subject. A is an easy subject, while to, to, to decide when a group is stable is difficult. And in some sense, the whole goal of this uh, the research these days and this seminar in particular is to develop techniques to prove that various groups are stable and, and other groups are non-stable and to find the, the, the boundary between them. Yeah. Thanks. So. Okay. So uh, well, well, at least one of the main theorems that uh, I want to mention today uh, is a joint work with Alex. And it says that if my group gamma is an infinite group with property T, which is also sophic, uh, if you don't remember what sophic is, just think uh, residually finite for now, it's still interesting, then it is not stable in permutations. Uh, I will give you a sketch of the proof in the case that gamma is SL3Z. Uh, but before I do, uh, I want to take the opportunity and to also mention a parallel theorem uh, about stability, not into symmetric, of homomorphisms, not into symmetric groups, but into unitary groups. Yeah. So if gamma is con-embeddable, um, also, Con embeddable is also called hyperlinear. And again, if you don't remember, just think residually finite, it's still interesting. Then gamma is not Hilbert Schmidt stable. Again, and property so, T, you forgot to write. Ah, yeah, so, sorry, yes. Again, again, it's, it, it is supposed to be like this theorem. So uh, it should be infinite con embeddable with property T. Yes. Sorry, uh, I think I asked this last time, isn't it property? Uh, finite quotients rather than, do you really need property T in this theorem? No, no, you need property, t uh, well, oh. for this one, you need property tau. Yeah, okay, okay, so I, I just want to. You need, uh, you need uh, the so-called property TFD, which is finite dimensional representations. Uh, right, so, uh, right, so they're very restricted. 
Or yes, you need yes. the isolation in, in a restricted family. Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's right. And we see it in the proof. So I'm just reminding you what Hilbert Schmidt stability is. Um, it is, well, stability of asymptotic homomorphisms like we had in the previous slides, only that now these, the functions that compose the asymptotic homomorphisms are into unitary groups. And the metric that I'm using is not the, not the normalized Hemming metric because these are not permutations, but the normalized Hilbert Schmidt metric. Uh, which is the, just the norm of A minus B, where the norm is sum of squares of an entry of a matrix divided by N square root. Okay. This is the norm that it corresponds to the Hemming metric on permutations under the embedding of sim N into UN. So uh, this is of the same family. Okay. So, can you also mention what does it mean to be cone-embeddable? Yes, cone-embeddable means that you that the group can be approximated by asymptotic homomorphisms, uh, which are, it means that you have asymptotic homomorphisms which are also asymptotically injective. So you can actually see the multiplication table of the group up to small errors. Uh, in unitary groups. But again, every every linear group, every s dolly finite group is like that. So yeah. it's uh, rich enough and uh, it's an open problem whether every group is a, a consumbedable or not. Maybe even every group is like that. Yeah. So one reason that I chose to, to mention this result so early before I'm sketching the proof for permutations is um, the following theorem that uh, that appears in uh, the paper of the Schiffre, Glebsky, Lubotsky, and Tom. Um, and it says in particular that many groups of property T are Frobenius stable, not Hilbert Schmidt stable by this theorem, um, but are Frobenius stable. Uh, and Frobenius stability is just the same thing of talking about homomorphisms into unitary groups. But now, just in this norm, the Frobenius norm, I'm not normalizing. I'm not dividing by n. Uh, so we see that the norm really does matter. Um, they are not Hilbert Schmidt stable, but many are Frobenius stable. Oren? Yes. I, I must say that at least if you take this analog to the permutation groups, this is obvious. Right, because the analog of the Frobenius norm will be something like the discrete distance between permutations, and then like uh, things I, cannot be too close one to one another or something. You mean if like it, it, it enlarges, it, it makes all distances quite large. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't try to work this out, but it's, it's a, it's a, it sounds right. I mean, yeah, if, if you embed the symmetric group into UN, but then use this metric, then you probably get something absolutely uh, easy, but yeah. But we're not doing that. Okay, uh, I, I, I'm coming back now to this theorem that appears on the bottom of the slide that I mentioned before about uh, stability and permutations and property T. Uh, but before that, uh, let me remind you what property T is, at least one definition of property T. Um, so a group, I, I, I'm just doing discrete groups. Uh, so a group gamma has property T if it has a Kashdan pair, S kappa, where S is a finite su subset of the group and kappa is some positive number. Uh, so I just need to tell you what a cash damper is. A cash damper is, well, it's a pair. S is a subset of the group and kappa is a real number, uh, positive to be interesting, such that for every unitary representation, if there is a vector in the Hilbert space, uh, which is the module of this representation, such that the, the set S, all of the elements in the set S barely move this element the, relative to its size. So they move it less than kappa relative to its size. Then there is a non-zero element of the Hilbert space, which is truly invariant under the group, the group action on the Hilbert space. Yeah, so the existence of an almost invariant vector uh, 
implies the existence of a non-zero actual invariant vector. And we're saying that infinite groups with this property, which are sophic, but just think about residually finite, uh, they are not stable. And I, I, will, I will give you a sketch of the proof now in a special case uh, where the group gamma is SL3Z. So here's a proof, or at least a sketch of one. Some notation for a prime under P, I'm considering um, the projective plane, uh, and I'm just taking the FP points. So I just mean uh, the lines through the origin in the three-dimensional space uh, over the uh, over the finite field FP. I'm writing NP for the cardinality of this set, and I'm noting that uh, SL3Z naturally acts on this plane, on this projective plane just because permutation uh, matrices act on lines. Uh, that's it, so permutations can act on lines. And formally, I am defining a homomorphism FP from SL3Z to the symmetry group on the projective plane by taking a matrix, reducing mod P. Now it's a matrix over FP. Now this matrix can act on lines and I don't really care what the underlying set is, so I'm just fixing some bijection between the projective plane uh, and the numbers one to P, and I just think of FP as an action of SL3Z on the numbers one to NP. That's it. I wrote here that this set is too transitive, so remember the too transitive means that uh, in this case, that for every pair of distinct lines and every extra pair of distinct lines, I have a single element of SL3Z that move the first line to the first line and the second line to the second line. So this is something that um, you can easily check about this action of SL3Z on lines. Uh, but all I want you to remember is that we constructed uh, a two transitive action of SL3Z on the numbers one to NP. The particular way that we did it doesn't really matter. Okay, so this is one thing, FP, which is a true action and true transitive. And I construct another function, not a homomorphism, called H prime P by taking SL3Z to sim NP. So the same, this should, should have been FP, sorry. So I'm taking the same homomorphism that I took here and over it, I am composing uh, or a map that takes permutations on one to NP and generates permutations on one to NP minus one. So we, I, I tell you what this, this function is in a moment. Uh, this is not a group homomorphism, but it somehow just shrinks a permutation by one element. This function, so I need to tell you for a permutation sigma, what is res of sigma? It's a permutation on one up to NP minus one. When it is acting on an element X, which is an element between one and NP minus one, it does the following. If sigma took X not to NP, then this new permutation, res of sigma, will just imitate what sigma does. So it sends x to sigma x. If sigma x is np, then our new permutation, which is just the permutations on one up to np minus one, is not allowed to take x to np because np is out of the set. So in this case, I just take sigma twice. So the first time sigma will take me to NP and then I take another sigma and I will get some element which is not NP and you can easily check that this is still a permutation. So this is, this is just a very simple way to turn a permutation from one to N on one to N to a permutation of one to N minus one and it is not a group homomorphism. So H prime P is not a group homomorphism. But you can easily check 
that because that this because of the fact that this change is so minor, this H prime p is still an asymptotic homomorphism. And since I'm proving instability here, my goal is to show you that H prime p is not perfect, is not asymptotically equivalent to a sequence of true homomorphisms. Uh, yeah, so this is, so the proof is not really over. I just have this uh, square here, but uh, just an artifact of the Beamer thing. And the proof continues. For the sake of contradiction, I'm now assuming that I have HP from SL3 Z to sim NP minus one, a sequence of true homomorphisms, one for each prime, that are asymptotically equivalent to those H prime P that we constructed on the previous slide. And I want to show that this assumption leads to a contradiction. Thinking about uh, actions as unitary representations, now I just abuse notation and this FP that we have on the previous slide, which was from SL3Z to sim NP, now I'm just thinking of it as permutation matrices instead of permutations and I'm not changing the notation. And I'm doing the same for HP. So I had two actions and now I'm thinking about them as unitary representations whose image are uh, permutation matrices. Now that I have uh, unitary representations, I can decompose them uh, and I'm not decomposing, I'm not saying that I'm decomposing all the way, but uh, this representation on the, on the vector space of functions from the number one to NP to the complex numbers, I, I just decompose it as a sum of a trivial representation and the orthogonal complement of the trivial representation, right? Here, here the trivial representation is just uh, the, fun the constant functions. And, and I'm doing the same to the representation HP. Uh, which is on the functions from one up to NP minus one to the complex numbers. I'm taking the trivial representation and the orthogonal complement. The thing is that once I do this, then VP must be irreducible. And this is the reason that I worked to ensure that FP that I created on this previous slide is too transitive. So this is, uh, uh, a short exercise in representation theory that if you take a two transitive action and you linearize it in this sense, that you think about it as permutation matrices, and then you decompose it, then what you get is the trivial representation that you always get when you linearize an action plus an irreducible. Uh, and, and this L2, it's a trivial representation plus something which maybe is irreducible, maybe not, I don't care. Okay. So remember that I'm trying to get to a contradiction. I, uh, I'm, I'm constructing now a map, phi p, from this up, which is a uh, one of the summons of L to NP minus one. It is, first I take the inclusion map into L to L to NP minus one. Then I, get, I take the inclusion map into LT or L2 of NP. Yes, just the most natural thing that you can think of sending uh, the indicator function of one to the indicator function of one, the indicator of two to the indicator of two and so on. And then from here, I can project into VP. So overall, I get some linear map, not a map of representations, from UP that lives here to VP that lives here and is irreducible. So overall, from all that we did now, we constructed linear maps from those UP of dimension N minus two to those VP of dimension N minus one, which are irreducible. And we did so for each prime number. And the thing is that this follows from the constructions, while these VP are not intertwiners, they are not morphisms of representations, 
they are asymptotically intertwiners, which means that, well, if there were really uh, morphisms of representations, then phi p and then fp of some generator would be equal to, um, to doing hp and then of some generator and then phi p by definition of a morphism of representations. Here, there is not really an equality, but if you look at the construction, asymptotically there is, there is an equality, meaning that the distance between those things, if I take the norm of the distance, these are two operators and the norms, the norm is not the operator norm, it's, the, it's like the, it's the two norm, thinking about them as vectors. And I divide, uh, the, I just normalize by the norm of phi p, then this goes to zero. So I have asymptotic intertwiners of those representations. Um, yeah, so I, here I call it approximate morphisms of representations. But since VP is irreducible, Schur's lemma tells us that there is no true intertwiner between them except for the zero map. So I got asymptotic intertwiners in a situation where there is no intertwiner except for zero. This is where property T is used. Um, property T implies that every approximate morphism, every approximate intertwiner like this, when P is large enough, it must be very close to a true morphism of representations. But if you check, Phi P is far from zero, which is the only morphism of representations between them, and, and this is the contradiction. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so when you say you consider UP and VP as a model, so we have the morphisms from UP into VP, right? So this is so they are model for which group? Uh, for SL3Z. Maybe it's worthwhile to mention uh, to the professionals, you know, who are, who are uh, kind of used to think about the failed topology of representation of SL3Z. This is a kind of elementary exposition uh, a, a, of the statement that if a group is property T, then by definition, the trivial representation is bounded away and isolated from the other representation. But as a consequence of that, you can deduce that every finite dimensional representation is bounded away also from the other representation. And basically what the proof here is using that if the, this, uh, uh, if the, the group would be stable, then this UP and VP will, will be get closer and closer to each other. And therefore there is no bounded away for this finite representation. And that's also a kind of answers Peter question. You see, you don't really, you play here only with finite representations so of property tau suffices. But that's yeah, kind of a, a remark from the they professional. Fact, they, are, they, fact, they, are, fact, they factor for a finite quotient. Yeah, those which fa factor for finite quotient. Uh, but but uh, did I answer the previous question as well? Was, is it okay? Okay. I, well, I mean, I just want to make sure that that uh, I understand it because I'm not sure whether the I don't know whether uh, about the SN three D, but I don't know whether SN three P the quotient of it can act on U P. I mean, I just took um, I had a permutation representation here, this H P, um, and then I just I decomposed it. Right, it certainly acts on the trivial part, and then UP is just the orthogonal complement, so it acts there too. Right. Yeah, that's that's the thing that uh, I'm I'm confused about. Maybe I, I need to think more, but I I am not sure that you you can have such a decomposition. But maybe I'm I'm confused by something. Yeah. Um, okay, so we can, we can try later. Yes. Okay. Um, so I just want to, to say that um, I showed you a sketch of a proof that I think works better 
what works better in a, in a talk, but actually I can use the same construction of removing a point um, by, uh, if I just assume that gamma has property T and that it has transitive actions on finite sets which are as large as I want. What I use in the proof is that SL3Z has actions on finite sets uh, which is are larger than I want and in a two transitive way. But the two transitivity, while I did use it in the proof, actually you, do, you can give a, a more subtle proof that doesn't use two transitivity and it's still true. Um, and as, uh, as Peter asked and uh, Alex answered, so I don't really need property tau uh, is enough, which is um, the same as the definition I gave you for property T, but only for uh, uh, representations that factor for finite quotients. So in particular, they are like representations of, of a finite group. Okay, I see that people are saying something in the chat. Okay, you're answering yourself, so I'll just continue. Okay. This was a negative result about stability. And now I want to relate it uh, to last week's talk uh, about test stability. And I, I will not recall the definition precisely, but, uh, but I will give uh, some details that uh, will also serve as uh, a kind of a reminder. So this is a theorem uh, will be uh, uploaded to the archive soon. Uh, under similar conditions that the group has property T and finite quotients uh, as large as I want, then gamma is not even testable, not only not stable, not, but not even testable. Um, if you remember what it is, great. If not, here I more or less am telling you what it means to be non-testable. So, uh, I'll read it, but maybe not exactly word by word. Being not testable means that every randomized machine that takes N and a D tuple of elements of sim N and either accepts or rejects the tuple and queries the, these permutations at, at most Q entries, such a machine cannot distinguish with great probability between the case where the tuple is actually a solution for E and the case where the tuple is far from a solution from E. It's not, no matter how much you let the, this machine run, it's not a matter of running time, if you just make a constant number of queries, um, which does not depend on the size of the permutations, you don't, sorry, you don't get enough information to distinguish between the two cases, no matter how much time you spend computing later. Right. So, and the proof is, uh, is quite similar, but you need to be, uh, a little more careful to see uh, this general claim about, uh, about algorithms and not just the claim about stability. Remember from Moshev's talk that uh, stability means that uh, there is a very particular kind of very efficient machines that can distinguish in this way. Non-stability just means that those very efficient machines cannot do distinguish in this way. But this theorem says that no machine that queries just a constant number of queries can do this um, distinguishing work. I, I'm summarizing and comparing. So we said that an infinite Sophie group in property T is not stable. Um, here again, I forgot to write property T, but these two theorems assume property T. So if gamma is infinite property T and let's leave the technical details. So if it's a property T is not stable, it's not even testable as long as it has a sophisticity or a finite quotient of unbounded cardinality. 
So property T groups are generally have negative results here. But if you compare it to last week's result that Jonathan mentioned, every amenable group is testable. Um, so this is in sharp contrast, and maybe we are kind of used to amenable groups being in contrast uh, with infinite Kashdan uh, groups, with infinite groups of property T. This is about testability. If I'm just talking about stability, then this is a theorem that I'm not sure if it if was mentioned um, so far, but I, I, I would assume that it will be mentioned in some of the subsequent talks, um, that some amenable groups are stable. Um, if a group is amenable, then it is stable if and only if every invariant random subgroup is cosophic. Is cosophic um, Okay, I'm not discussing those terms now, but it just means that some amenable groups are cosophic. And, and in fact, um, the, the result of, uh, of, let's, of, of Arjan Sefano and Parnesco about uh, Z squared and Lambidian groups in general, which was already discussed, is an example of this, that some amenable groups are, are stable. Uh, I have a question. Firstly, on the second theorem there, is property T missing? Yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot it again. Yeah, uh, and secondly, it's not clear. It seems to me that theorem B is quite a bit more difficult than theorem A. You didn't. Are you going to explain it, or is it? It's uh, kind the second, of the, uh, the second theorem. Yeah, that is not uh, testable. It's not in the slides, but uh, but I can do it uh, orally. Um, so um, I I think yes, and and now actually would be a good time. So I'll just do it now. Um, <coughs> The thing is that, um, well, maybe I don't want to do it in general, but I can do it again for the case of S SL3Z. Um, in my understanding is now we have a statistical statement. Is that correct? Rather yes, than this, this is exactly correct. And so a statistical <laughs> statement, uh, yeah, and how that, how you use property T there, or, or do you use, I mean, uh, in the last lecture, Benjamini Schramm convergence was mentioned, and I'm kind of curious if that's somewhere here. Yeah, it, it is. This is exactly what is used here. Okay, then I want to hear it. By the way, I, I'll mute myself because there's a lawnmower right outside my room. Yeah, okay. And, and I hope that you don't hear the hotel they're building outside uh, my window. Um, right. So, uh, so, so now I, I see I, I'm going faster than I, than I thought I would. So I, I will. Uh, I will just do it now and, and give you some details about this, this theorem uh, about non-testability. Um, so the point is that, um, I, let's just do it for gamma being SL3Z. Um, you can look at the actions of SL3Z, let's say uh, on the projective plane over FP and on the projective plane over FQ, for where Q is another prime number very close to P. And then you can take this uh, projective plane on FQ uh, and then where Q is, let's say, a prime close to P but a little larger. And then do this removing of one point, but actually remove more points, remove uh, Q minus P points. Uh, or not Q minus P, but uh, remove enough points so that both of them are the same size. Then statistically, they will be very similar. Um, and, uh, and you can just repeat the same proof um, to show that um, one of them is coming from two actions. So these are actual homomorphisms. And the other one, the ones that you took a slightly larger primes and removed points, uh, is not close to any action for with the same proof. Uh, but uh, Binyamin Ishram, they are very, very close. Um, so actually, that, that's it. I am done with, uh, with the property T results, but. Uh, so, sorry, I, I, I had to step on it. Um, so, when you took two different primes, or they're they close, they're statistically close, so they're, we're yes, saying that these quotients are 
I mean, the actual quotients of Binyamini Shram close to each other and close to some universal thing. Is that right? Yeah, yes, that's exactly right. It's not exactly the proof that we will give in the paper because we are doing a general case, but uh, but this is what I would do for the self -reset. And And, uh, and uh, again, and now uh, the property tau. Okay, mm -hmm. I, the reason I ask this is are we using the full force of property tau or are we using something much weaker? Do you really need the isolation? Um, yes. Anyway, uh, I mean, uh, I, possibly I don't actually need it because I think that we are improving something a little stronger, that it's not only that the constant number of queries is not enough, but even if you have a mild dependence on N, it's still not enough. And I think that if you just want to prove this for a constant number of queries, then possibly you need something which is less than isolation, but I've, I did not really like do all the details. Uh, uh, the, the reason I asked that is it seems, because more or less Binyamini Shram, once, if, if you have these objects, Binyamini Shram converging, it yeah. means the spectra converge, but not with a fixed gap, but sort of more statistically itself. So the whole thing becomes a more statistical statement. I'm just trying to understand the the, the workings of the proof. I understand your proof now. But, um, oh, okay. So I, I'm moving along to to a weaker notion of stability um, in order to tell you about some results, but mainly in order to ask questions. So. All of the results that I mentioned before, the instability that I actually sketched you and the non-stability, which I only sketched early, they all use this construction of taking a two action and removing a point. And then showing that what you obtained is not close to an action on n minus one points, but it is certainly close to an action on n points because I started with n, a two action on n points and removed, the, and removed one. So it makes sense to have a more flexible definition. And for this, I need to extend my definition of the normalized Hamming metric so that I can measure distance between permutations sigma and tau, which live in different finite symmetric groups. One in sigma and sim capital K, uh, and tau and sim K, where capital K is at least K, but maybe bigger. And the distance, the way that I measure it, I count the number of x's between one and k, little k, where the permutations differ. But then for all other entries of the larger permutations, we don't, which don't have a parallel entry of the smaller permutation because it's too small, I just give this punishment. And then I divide by the size of, let's say, the, the larger one. Um, this gives me a metric, which is not just on one particular symmetric group, but it's a metric on the union of symmetric groups. Um, and now I can start comparing permutations uh, of different sizes. I'm just noting here that with this definition, the ratio between capital K and little k is close to one if the permutations are close. It's always, it's at least one if I assume that K is the larger of the two, but if you just unwind the definition here, you'd see that it's at most one over one minus the distance. So uh, if permutations are close, it means that they live in symmetric groups of similar size. Uh, with this definition. There are also other definitions which don't make it happen, but this is, this is my definition now. And now I can redefine stability. I said that the group gamma is flexibly stable if every asymptotic homomorphism is so far just as before, if for every asymptotic homomorphism, there is a sequence of true homomorphisms but now I'm letting the, those two homomorphisms be into larger symmetric groups if they want to, such that Fn, the asymptotic homomorphism, and Hn, the sequence of homomorphisms, are asymptotically equivalent. And I've used here the normalized Hamming metric 
but the extended definition from the previous slide. So now this is still open, as far as I know, if there is any infinite group with property T which is flexibly stable. And the proof that I've shown you doesn't say anything about that because I've just, by construction, I just took big K to be little K plus one and remove the points. So certainly if I am allowed to add the point back, then the proof that I showed you does not show instability. And I think that this definition of flexible stability is very interesting, maybe even more interesting. Uh, and this is why I want to, to discuss it a little more, what's known about it, uh, what isn't. I'll start with the following theorem uh, of Bowen and Burton, and possibly, I don't remember, maybe it's one of the next talks. Um, if one can show for at least one D, at yeah, least in, five. In two weeks, in two weeks, uh, Burton will give us a talk exactly on this uh, very interesting theorem. Yeah. Right. So, okay, so, uh, so we will have a lot of details for it, but uh, if, if, if for one D, at least five, you can show that PSLDZ is flexibly stable, then there is a non sophy group. Uh, so, uh, we will hear the details, but if I remember correctly, this non sophic gr group is just, you take some HNN extension of PSLDZ uh, along two isomorphic free subgroups of rank for each, and then you just, you, you take a, some quotient of this HNN extension, and this would be the non sophic group, uh, but we will hear more about this. Uh, well, uh, it's kind of curious that <clears throat> D equals five would come into here. Can you, do you know what that? Uh, yes, I think, I think that this is a technical condition uh, and it's probably two uh, for, two, for uh, three and four but, as well. Uh, I guess I'm, I don't, can't even, what kind of theorem are they quoting that's true for five and not true for four? Mm, I mean, I, well, we will, have, we will have to ask them, but I, I, I did read uh, kind Alex, of- Alex, you were muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you have to put the free group uh, inside the group in a kind of a spatial way. So it's it's it's, it's okay, probably true. just a technicality. If, if, oh, okay. you, if you if somebody would prove that SL3Z is flexible yeah, stable, okay. then it probably would be able. And, and then the other question I have is: is the general belief that every group, uh, that there is no non sophic group? What, what is what's the general belief? Um, Not all groups are sophic. This is the general. Yeah, idea. I think I think nowadays people uh, don't see why. Yeah. Okay. But it's very difficult. Uh, uh, as as I explained, and it will come up also in the, this seminar. It's only in the last uh, uh, two years that the, we have some example of group which are not approximated with some interesting uh, things which similar to sophic. But for, but uh, it also explain why sophic is more difficult. So. Did Gromov or Benji Weiss make a conjecture? Did they offer an opinion? Uh, no, they they uh, I think they were careful to ask it as a question. On the other hand, Kirchberg ask exactly the same problem with respect to the operator norm. I think that he made a conjecture that every group is approximated by the unitary group with the operator, but I think that the feeling now that none of them is true, that it's also, and we will understand why these three cases are more difficult than the others that we managed to solve. There is a, it looks like a technical problem, but uh, we'll see, maybe, maybe the seminar will lead to a solution of that. I want to mention uh, regarding this theorem of Bowen and Burton that um, at, least, at least in the first version, it wasn't mentioned there, but um, they are actually not requiring the full strength of flexible stability, but of something that uh, along the paper of uh, Jean Stefano Panesco, I, I call weak flexible stability, which means that they want this flexible stability, not with respect to all asymptotic homomorphisms, but what they actually use is that every asymptotically homomorphism, which is asymptotically injective, is perfect. So this might be an easier problem than to prove that PSL DZ is, is flexibly stable. You only need it for, for 
these things, which are actually the sophic approximations of PSLPZ. Um, yeah, so th this is worth noting. Again, in this uh, non sophic group, uh, something much simpler in this uh, non sophic group plan is that the observation mentioned in Alex's talk that if a group is stable and not residually finite, then it's not sophic, then you don't you, you can replace this table with flexibly stable and, and the observation remains correct and you can even replace it with some weaker notions with weak very flexible stability uh, you can look at the paper uh, by uh, by alex and me uh, stability and property t where we explain what it is this is uh, you, you 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 really for this observation you need uh, you, you can do with uh, much weaker notions of of stability and flexible stability. More on flexible stability. First, for amenable groups, stability and flexible stability are just the same. Um, the way I see it is, uh, the way I know it is that I, I, I gave you earlier uh, a theorem that says exactly when an amenable group is stable. So the, the proof of the theorem works with stability and works with flexible stability. So um, let's just take it now for, as a fact that for amenable groups, those notions are just the same, but we actually don't know if uh, flexible stability is any different uh, from stability. Maybe it's just the same. We don't have an example of a flexibly stable group, which is not stable. Some more examples are, um, uh, this group, it's uh, the fundamental group of, uh, of a uh, surface, uh, or, or I, I mean a, a closed orientable surface. So uh, this is just this one relator group. It, it is uh, known to be flexibly stable by uh, deep result of Lazarovich, Levitz, and Minsky. Um, in the property testing world, it just means that this single equation, product of commutator, uh, can be tested by just substituting in uh, elements of the permutations uh, by the sample and substitute algorithm that Jonathan mentioned. Uh, yeah, so, so this is known to be flexibly stable. And uh, as you can see with this open question, I do, we don't know if it's stable. Um, Lazarovitz will talk about exactly this theorem in three weeks in the seminar. It is tempting to think, okay, maybe all world hyperbolic groups are, are flexibly stable, but uh, but but this is this is not true. Um, again, Alex and I are explaining it in our in our, uh, in our th paper about stability and property T. And more recently, Adrian Joanna, which is talking next week. Uh, gave many flexible instability results, which are very interesting. Uh, so we'll have them next week. And uh, I, I am done. <laughs> there is no thank you slides, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, are there some more questions? Yeah. Can uh, this notion of flexible stability, can I formulate it as uh, in terms of a sequence of, of maps into just the infinite symmetric group rather than sort of a sequence of maps into these different symmetric groups? Is there a... Um, the thing is that for flexible stability, as I stated it, you need to remember you need to remember the size of the permutations for uh, to know what to normalize by. Um, possibly you can normalize by the size of the support, but uh, I need to think if it really works. Yeah, I thought, I thought you said that this uh, defines a metric. On the... You ask for each n, you need for each n, you need an identity of itself. You cannot uh, use, define it using a support. Well, a net, what is the metric? You see, you have to define what is your metric on the on this symmetric. No, 
But Alex, we have a metric. That what uh, Oren uh, described is a metric on this set, but there are infinitely many identities in this set. There is the identity that comes from S1, the identity that comes from S2. They seem like the same uh, element, but they are not in this uh, union. You need to strictly take them to be different uh, permutations. I'm not sure I understand what you said. You cannot think of it as like an action on in, an infinite, uh, on the natural numbers or something and just look at the support and, uh, and normalize using the support. This is what I meant. That you need actually to think of it as a, as a union of the, uh, uh, disjoint union of the symmetric groups for this, this distance to be yeah, satisfy all the nice properties that it needs. But this is exactly what I said. You take, I guess Ned was talking about the permutation of the integers or the natural numbers with finite support. And now in principle, once you have a group with a bi-invariant metric, you can define the notion of stability. The problem is that I, we found it difficult to think which type of a metric you have on that, uh, on that group. Except, of course, you can always define the trivial uh, matrix, but then the, all, the whole notion is not interesting. Uh, I see that Kasabo wants to say something. Why don't you talk, uh, Martin? You... Martin, I see you, you send the chat. Ah, okay. Uh, I just read what uh, Martin Casabo is writing. He said, I think Net is right, and one should be able to phrase this in the symmetry group of the infinity with finite support, but his microphone does not uh, work, so he cannot tell us exactly how. Uh, Alex, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, now we hear you. Yeah, we okay. hear you. So I really think Nate is right. It's not a trivial thing to like define this metric on the infinite symmetric group, but there should be something which works. And that might be a slightly better way to phrase the question, but okay, I need to think about it and like I'll try to make it work. Mm -hmm. Okay, why don't you, maybe if you have an idea, you can, you can send me, I can send it to all the people which are on my email list. And we can think about that. It might be an interesting um, additional or equivalent or an additional direction. OK. You... If I have some ideas, I will email you in the next like, week or so. Thank you. Some uh, more questions? Yeah. On your last Please. slide, uh, in the case of the surface group, which is hyperbolic, yeah. and then you say the ones which or non, uh, which are word hyperbolic, but not flexibly stable. Do you understand which, in terms of hype, what's the property of those groups that makes it fail? And, and do you know which- I can which tell you how to, how, to, how to come up with them and then we can think, uh, so- Do you have a classification in terms of the hyperbolic groups? What's, what's the property that's making it true or not true? Uh, I mean, no, no, it's far, it's far from that. I, I mean, I can tell you what, what's behind this note. It's, it's, not, very, it's not very long. Uh, you can start with any finitely presented uh, group which is not flexibly stable. For example, bounds are solitar two, three, uh, finitely presented and not flexibly stable. And then you can use all, all, all that's behind this note is to use the Reeves construction uh, to find uh, a small cancellation group that subjects into BS two, three uh, with a, a kernel which is finitely presented. Subjects onto BS BS two three and the kernel. This is part of the point of the Ribs construction. Um, is finitely is a finitely generated group, and then this is a basic result that I didn't mention. Stability goes to quotients if the kernel is finitely generated as a group, and then the same is true for flexible stability. And this is how this is why I said. All right, but how about a uh, group? Okay, I don't know these weird groups, but how about something like the fundamental group, a three manifold group? Um, we, don't, we don't know. There are, there are some cases there that you have normal subgroups which are, uh, which are finitely generated. 
Yeah. But the kind of coercion, at least that I know, are, are free group or something. You, you see, if you want to prove instability, then you need, and to use this technique, then you have to, to get that this quotient will be uh, very complicated. And I just don't know examples like that. So uh, it's not related to kind of the Magnus recognition of subgroups in terms of generators problem, which is also complicated in this. Yeah, group. we don't know. We don't know. No. Yeah, we have, I mean, you know, this, this exactly, maybe at the end of this seminar, some people will work okay. on that. The, this notion of stability looks very interesting and natural uh, for its own shake. And you can ask millions of questions like the, the, uh, the uh, given a finitely presented group, uh, is there an algorithm to decide whether it's stable or not? Is there, uh, and all this looks, uh, uh, we are only in the very basic stages. So we don't know yet. Good. I have a little question. Could you go to the slide before, I think? This or one? Maybe, uh, maybe with this one, this one, yeah. So uh, the question is, so you, you mentioned here property T, but uh, about property tau, uh, could we kind of find a, a property tau group uh, in, in both things, in, in your open question, but also in this theorem, uh, Bowen Barton? Yeah. So the open question is still open for Tau. Yeah. And here in the bone button, um, yeah, I mean, I looked, it, it's almost a year since I looked in this paper, but uh, I, I guess that Tau is enough. I, mean, I, I can't tell you it with, I mean, well, I mean, they, they use more than Tau, they use more than Tau, yes, they use some particular structure of PSLDZ, but before that they have, no, but, but she, she is right that is what I think, if I remember correctly, the vaguely the, the proof, we'll see it in two weeks and we'll, we can check carefully, that what is using from the T part of PSL disease only tau. Yes, I, yeah. I think so. I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe we have some flexibility, say, to find all these contraexamples, yeah? Yeah, th there is some flexibility of, of, of for finding flexible stability. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry if it was already uh, stated, but do we know if the stability plus uh, not visibly finite implies not sophic? What's it again? Yeah, flexible stability plus none. Stability? No, 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 what? stability. Testability. Testability. Ah. All amenable groups are, are testable. So that, that's, I mean, and some of them are not residually finite. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Could you please go back to the, uh, to the slide uh, about UP and VP, please? Oh, Sorry. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, thank you. Well, is it possible to get on the slide? I am willing to share the slides. Yes, I can send them to Alex or, or, or to whoever asks me. Yeah, thank you. Okay, some more questions, remark. Okay, thank you very much, Oren. Uh, we'll see you next week and we will continue to hear, I think uh, Johanna is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is the next speaker next Wednesday. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.